comics are in danger. At the time of me making this, Diamond Distribution, also known as the only direct market distributor, has stopped its presence. Thanks to, well, you know why. Just, just look at the date. Comic specialty shops are about to enter uncertain times. The mainstream comics medium as we know it is heading into foreign waters. So, how do we get here, and why should we care? Comics as we know them started with newspapers. From being printed in back pages as good old funnies to being printed on their own, the newsstand was home to comics for several decades. Every Thursday, kids would go to drug and candy stores to read what had been shipped in that week. This distribution system relied on two things, cheap comics and returnability. See, comics were a penny business, like candy and gum. Publishers would directly sell to newsstand distributors at a discounted price, and those distributors would in turn sell them to retailers at a slightly marked up price in bulk. Comics usually sold for around 10 to 12 cents each, cheap enough for people to pick up without putting a dent in their pockets. To encourage bulk sales, publishers made all of their titles returnable, meaning any unsold stock could be returned to distributors provided retailers ripped the covers off all the books to prove they were unsold. Back then, if less than 65% of the publisher's stock was returned, their book was considered a hit. This meant that any and all financial risk was on the publisher, not the retailers. But here's the problem. That system was broken. It was a system rife with fraud. Books could be reported as unsold if they didn't fit onto shipping trucks, and coverless books returned to the distributors would be funneled into flea markets with no money going back to publishers. Not to mention, of course, that not all newsstands would receive the same books, meaning customers had to run around to different newsstands to see which ones carried the books they wanted. The system needed to be flipped on its head. And it would. By the early 70s, comic book specialty shops were beginning to pop up here and there, selling back issues from newsstands as well as underground comics. The number of shops was somewhere in the low 200s. Newsstand sales, on the other hand, were on rocky waters. Years of the same system, and the decimation of the industry as a whole thanks to Frederick Wortham and the Comics Code Authority, topics for a whole another video, things weren't looking too hot. Phil Sealing was unhappy with the way the system was run and was confident that he could do better. Sealing was an English teacher from Brooklyn by day, and a back-issue comic book retailer by night. You know, also in Brooklyn. He was unhappy with the sheer number of comics being returned to publishers, and wanted to create a new system to circumvent that. So in 1972, Sealing founded Seagate Distributors, named after the Seagate community in... guess where? And in doing so, started the direct market. The direct market was founded on four principles. Timing quality, content, and appealing to fans. Seagate would buy comics directly from publishers and sell them to retailers, the retailers in this case being local comic shops, or LCSs for short. Retailers would consistently get comics on time, in great condition compared to newsstands, and since this new system shipped by product rather than in bulk, fans would get the books they wanted at the shops they wanted to get them at. This also allowed for retailers to win back older audiences by offering more risque content that newsstands wouldn't ever dare publish. But, and this is a big but, there was one caveat. Comics couldn't be returned to the distributor. Whatever stock wasn't sold became back issue stock. This meant that instead of the financial risk being put on publishers, it was now on the retailers. Well that's fine, cause comics were selling like hotcakes. The number of LCSs skyrocketed, going from the low 200s in the early 70s to roughly 1500 by 1980. You know what else skyrocketed? Comic prices. Comics were no longer the penny business they were prior, and this was reflected in their prices. Sealing cut deals with Marvel, DC, Archie, and Warren Publishing, and established a nice little monopoly on comics distribution by dropshipping product, and establishing sub-distributors. Definitely legal, definitely cool. Mm, except it wasn't. Seagate got sued by New Media Urjax on the basis of antitrust. 
Seagate lost a lot of its hold on its sub-distributors and then shut down in 1985, a year after Sealing's death. Urjax actually went out of business three years earlier, with its warehouses forming the basis for a little distributor known as Diamond Distribution. More on them later. Newsstands slowly acknowledged the end of them actively carrying comics, especially with initiatives like direct market exclusive books from publishers like Marvel and DC. The direct market was on the rise, and soon enough, it would hit its first pitfall. Remember Ninja Turtles? You know, those Ninja Turtles. Remember how they started as a comic? You know, before that, 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 and that, TMNT was an indie comic book created by buddies Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And I know what you're thinking. What do these fucking titles have to do with comics distribution? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles launched in 1984 as a black and white indie comic book and a relatively limited print at that. Scarcity of that initial print run led to collectors flipping their copies for roughly $100 just a year later compared to the buck fifty they initially sold for. Business was booming for speculators, people picking up those first issues and flipping them for a profit. It was buck wild, and with that success came imitators hoping to recreate that flash in the pan. Soon, the direct market was flooded with high print number ones of crappy black and white indie TMNT knockoffs, and given that nice little caveat from before, shops were forced to either sell the books or have them pile up in their overstock. Compared to before, where retailers could just rip off the covers and return the books they didn't sell, retailers were forced to accept their loss. Eventually, the bottom fell out, and the black and white bubble popped in 1987. This was a huge loss for LCSs, with quite a few shutting down, but it wasn't the worst one yet. Remember Diamond Distribution, that little, little company that managed to cop those Urjax warehouses back in 82? Well, it got big. Real big. Through several acquisitions in the 80s, it had become one of the two major distributors in the industry by 1994. Founded in Baltimore by one Steve Jeppe in 1982, Diamond Distribution built itself up on the backs of defunct distributors. With each small distribution company that quickly found themselves overwhelmed by the industry came a new acquisition for Diamond, expanding their reach on the industry's warehouses. While Diamond highlandered their way up to the top of the distribution throne, speculation surprisingly hadn't died off. In fact, you could say things were speculator booming. Issue number ones had become collector items, and nowhere better was this exemplified than during the releases of 1990's Spider-Man No. 1 and 1991's X-Men No. 1 and X-Force No. 1. Each of these had their own gimmick to alert collectors, be it flashy variants, polybag collectible trading cards, or connecting covers, and this was a recurring theme that defined the 90s. To this day, X-Men No. 1 remains the highest selling individual issue in the comics industry. Marvel was rolling in that dough, and things were looking pretty good. That is, of course, until the three creators that helped make those books successes, Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, and Rob Liefeld, promptly went and started their own publishing company, a little company called Image Comics. You might have heard of them. Okay, so things weren't looking too hot, which wasn't good for Marvel's owner at the time, Ronald Perelman. You see, Perelman had been doing some fucky things with Marvel's stocks at the time and was banking on Marvel's successes for his actions to pan out. Marvel quickly got into the business of acquisitions, acquiring the trading card companies Fleer and Skybox before acquiring the third largest distribution company at the time, Heroes World, in 1995. Heroes World would be the exclusive distributor for Marvel's comics at the time, replacing their deal with Diamond. Prior to the Heroes World acquisition, distributors had no real exclusivity contracts. This was a clear power play by Perelman and Marvel to establish a distributor monopoly. DC promptly responded by establishing an exclusive partnership with Diamond. Diamond then also became the exclusive distributors for Image, Dark Horse, Acclaim, and other publishers too. The odds just weren't in Marvel's favor. Here's the issue. Heroes World lacked the resources required to keep up with distributing the largest comics publisher at the time, often leading to late, fumbled, or even forgotten orders. 
This ended up biting Marvel in the ass as Heroes World went out of business in 1997, shortly after Marvel itself went bankrupt. It didn't help that the end of the trading card boom led to Fleer and Skybox also taking big losses. This ended up forcing Marvel back into a now unbeatable Diamond's hands. Well, hold on, if Diamond is distributing pretty much all of the comics that the industry has to offer, doesn't that raise some antitrust issues? Yeah, it did actually. The US Department of Justice launched an investigation into Diamond in 1997 for possible antitrust violations, but surprisingly dropped the investigation in November of 2000 on the basis that, despite Diamond having a monopoly on comic book direct market distribution, it didn't have a monopoly on book distribution in general. Diamond subsequently consolidated into book distribution, selling graphic novels and trade paperbacks directly to bookstores. Great work, team. So, the 90s were great for Diamond, but what about the local comic shops that Diamond made its business from? Uh, well, it wasn't great for them. Remember Image Comics? Image was a great success through and through, and with its creators rolling in the dough and getting Levi's ad deals, putting comics out on time wasn't the biggest of their concerns. After just a year of publishing, 11 out of Image's 13 books weren't being published on time. This reached a boiling point with Image's crossover with fellow publisher Valiant, titled Deathmate. Valiant's half of the crossover came out on time in 1993. Image's half, on the other hand, came out almost a year late in 1994. This left retailers with a boatload of overstock, as readers just stopped caring for the event itself. This wasn't the only event that screwed LCSs over, though. The 90s were a tumultuous time, and similarly to the black and white indie publishers in the 80s, Marvel, DC, Valiant, and others were all flooding the market with high print, low quality comics. So much product, and not enough customers to buy that product, led to LCSs flooding themselves both financially and physically, as they were left with piles and piles of unsold comics. If only there was a precedent, something that could have warned the industry ahead of time. It's estimated that of the roughly 10,000 shops that existed at the start of the decade, 6,000 shops had closed by the end of the 90s. The industry came out of the 90s rough, battered, and bruised, with Diamond as its sole direct market distributor. But the 2000s brought several changes that would shake things up. First was the popularization of the trade paperback and graphic novel format. Comics were now finding spots in bookstores through the form of thicker collected editions. This has led to critical and commercial successes like Raina Telgemeier's series of books, which at one point counted for 5% of the entire bookstore comics market. Her book Guts was at one point in 2019 the best-selling book in America. Not graphic novel, book. That's impressive. The other big change was the advent of the internet. With it came both good and bad, as the internet not only allowed for the popularization of webcomics and crowdfunded comics, but also the facilitation of piracy of comics. Publishers also took advantage of the new medium by publishing their books digitally, either through their own websites or through online distributors like Comixology. The digital market isn't without fault though, as it has its own set of problems, like how it makes piracy even easier without proper DRM measures in place, or how a digital copy of a comic costs the exact same as a printed floppy despite not having any of the associated printing costs. Even with all these new changes, the comics industry kept chugging along, putting out new issues each week. That is, until now. It's March 24th, 2020 as I'm making this video, and on March 23rd, Diamond announced that it would be stopping its distribution to comic stores given... It's a good move on their part, even if a bit late. With the world in the midst of a global pandemic, comic shops are being forced to rework their sales methods, rushing to adapt methods like delivery and curbside pickup to keep up with customer demand. They are understandably overwhelmed. With governments forcing shutdowns and the call for social distancing, stores are getting hit the hardest. So what happens now? Does this spell the end of the comic book industry? Publishers are being given two options, either hold back their product until things tide over, or embrace the digital market harder than before and continue as scheduled. Doing the latter has its fair share of problems, 
By going fully digital, publishers might potentially lose out on the sales from diehard physical copy buyers, be it out of principle or value assessment. Like I mentioned before, comics are still being sold digitally for the same price as physical comics, which might turn people off, or worse yet, force them to embrace piracy. On the other hand, digital comics take sales out of comic shop pockets. These aren't major franchise stores we're talking about. They're small mom and pop specialty shops that rely on the sales of their books to stay in business. Odds are, most people buying comics digitally aren't going to be incentivized to buy those same books physically for the same price at a later date. But I could be wrong. Speculating is also still a thing that exists to this day, and it will undoubtedly also take a big hit during this time. But f*** them. With those necessary sales not coming in, what does this spell for LCSs? Truth is, no one knows yet. Everything's up in the air right now. Diamond shutting its operations temporarily is a good thing, not only for the health and safety of comic shop workers, but potentially for the industry itself too. With Diamond on hold, this is the perfect opportunity for the industry to actually sit down and rethink what works and doesn't work with the system, and potentially rejecting the monopoly that Diamond has on it. Diamond's been notorious for f***ing comic shops over with damaged shipments, missing shipments, and just overall negligence, which they can afford to do given their monopoly. But who knows? Things could go any which way. Here's to hoping the industry goes up, not down from here. Stay safe, wash your hands, support your local comic shop in any way you can. I'm gonna go f start a podcast or something. I don't